Good evening, everyone. I would like to call to order the regular uh, June 6, 2013 meeting of the Olathe District Schools Board of Education. Ms. Hibbs, would you call the roll, please? Yes. Ms. Ashley? Here. Dr. Daniels? Here. Mrs. Felter? Mrs. Martin? Here. Mr. Parker? Here. Mr. Polin? Here. Mr. Shear? Here. Would everyone rise for the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have one presentation this evening. It will be on the middle school technical education program. And it looks like Mrs. Hermeck is going to lead us tonight. Yes, thank you. Um, good evening. Our teaching and learning focus tonight highlights middle school um, technical education elective coursework. Um, after a year, or actually a decade, of implementation with our current resources, our curriculum and revision cycle launched this past year a year-long study of updated resources um, that would meet the needs of our students in impact learning. Um, we know that middle school education is a time that our students get a chance to explore and broaden their course interests and learning interests with elective course choices for the first time. Um, this, what we need to provide with our curriculum is, is an opportunity to meet wide variety of student learning needs and interests. And also the coursework we offer in the middle school also paves the way for future course interests that they would pursue in <laughs> high school. Our middle school tech curriculum is actually delivered um, solely through the use of technology with an instructor trained to and leading students uh, to implement a project-based curriculum. Very exciting for our students. We appreciate the opportunity tonight to highlight this middle school um, tech ed coursework through a variety of perspectives. Um, Mrs. Denise Griffey will talk about it from the uh, technical, educational technical ed coordination for the district career tech ed. Jeff Laughlin is an instructor at Oregon Trail, and Dr. Stacy Yurkovich provides the principal perspective from Prairie Tech. Mrs. Griffey. Now I would like you to go on a journey with me, back to the time when you were in junior high or high school, and think about the shop or the tech ed programs. What did the classes look like? <laughs> what students were in the class? And what type of activities were they working on? Well, we all have our stories, and they're very memorable from our school experience, and I would like to share one with you tonight. It was the spring of my sophomore year, and I was making my course selection for the following year. I was looking over my elective course options, and I thought drafting would be an interesting course. Well, when I went to talk to my guidance counselor and tell him that I wanted to take the drafting course, he told me, girls don't take that class. <laughs> And so with that, I ended up that, okay, I didn't take that answer. I followed up and I asked a few questions. And I said, well, why can't girls take that class? And a couple of things I heard is that girls just don't do that class. Also, there are no girls' restrooms in, the, in that building. <laughs> in my time, the shop or drafting class ended up to be in the bus barn. The bus barn was across the street from the high school. And for some reason, there was this invisible line between those two buildings, and students did not, or girls did not cross that line. Well, with a little problem solving from a counselor and my mother, we, <laughs> that this problem was resolved and decided that girls could take the class. In the eyes of the 16-year-old, crisis averted. As my high school yearbook referenced, history was made, and the liberation movement rolled into the shop program. <laughs> The exciting part of my story is that the shop in the tech ed classroom today looks significantly different from that. And what we'd like to do right now is show you a little video clip of a classroom that's actively engaged.
There's something going on in this classroom that has students fired up. It's, it's life-changing. Fantastic. My first day in here was like, wow. Educators are energized. It's excitement in education. And the sponsors of the classroom are thinking about the future. It's an investment in the people that we need uh, in our business in the future. Synergistic modules are a revolutionary new method for teaching at the middle level grades. Students work in pairs at a workstation called a module that contains everything they need for standards-based hands-on learning. Each workstation is outfitted with a multimedia curriculum delivered on the module's networked computer. Module curriculum is completed in seven class sessions, after which students move to a new module to learn new content with a new partner. As shown in the video, students are actively engaged with the curriculum. Our Olathe students are able to engage with this curriculum in our Technology 6 and our Exploration and Technology courses. Here is a list of a summary of the key concepts that students study in that class. You will hear more detail later from Stacy in our presentation about these concepts. These courses also provide students with the opportunity to explore topics, and this is a list of the topics, and they range from communication to electronics to robots. They provided, to provide additional detail about these modules, Jeff will give you, share with you some of his classroom experiences. The good thing about being in the classroom is uh, you constantly get to hear the phrases, oh yeah, this is, this is where this is actually put into use. Could be from the, like ratios to fractions to just like the Pythagorean theorem or just basic triangles and shapes. Oh, uh, just in the pictures that are offered up there in front of us, uh, the kids are actually going through and working with like the angles of reflection to actually sell or cook a hot dog. Or it could be the fact that they're working in pairs to go through and create, well, to create a creative solution. Oh, uh, where they're gonna go through and solve problems. Oh, uh, in the picture on the left, the students are actually going through and using the design process that they actually use in the auto industry. Instead of taking seven years, they just dwindle it down to seven days. Uh, well, they go through and make thumbnail sketches, rough sketches, finished drawings. And then they actually get to go through and produce their own dragster and actually go ahead and race it against head-to-head -head competition. Uh, well, on the picture on the right, the kids are actually using a, a robotic lunar rover. Oh, uh, kids, the great part about this program is it's all hands-on. You know, you get to see them exploring, learning, you know, just following through with the stuff that they're taught in their core classes each and every day in this class. As a middle school administrator, I've seen the change take place from uh, the narrow focus of the traditional wood shop and metals to technical education. Over time, this program has benefited thousands of students in Olathe, all types of students and learning styles. For those who are kinesthetic learners, the hands-on style of learning is, is a perfect fit. Audio instruction meets the needs of audio learners and enhances um, the, provides enhancement for the visual learners as well. The tech ed courses appeal to students all along the, the um, continuum of academic skills as well. The modules have a direct correlation to STEM careers for students interested in science, technology, engineering, and math fields. Developmentally, middle school students need physical activity and they thrive on social interaction for their learning. In this program, they're provided both. Modules are completed in pairs or teams, involve hands-on learning, integrated into the use of technology, and students rotate <coughs> modules every seven to 10 days. Inquiry and problem solving are at the core of each module, which challenges the learner and provides opportunity to apply the learning to real world situations. The learning is meaningful and immediately offers relevance to the learner, which addresses another developmental need for the middle school student and answers questions we often hear at the middle school. How does this apply to me and when am I ever gonna use this? 
During the time that Tech Ed has been implemented at the middle level, the curriculum strongly supported the math, reading, and <coughs> science state standards and indicators. And of course, now we're experiencing that shift to Kansas College and career ready standards. Although those standards look different, the program continues to address and support them. Academic preparation is supported through the STEM strands that we've already talked about, cognitive preparation through problem solving and application of knowledge, technical skills are the basis for each of the modules, and employability <coughs> skills are addressed through working with others, time management, and career explorations. Oops. Am I? There we go. In addition, the technology modules provide a basis and connection to 21st century high school programs such as aerospace and engineering and e-communications. The video provided a snapshot of the opportunities offered through TechEd. On behalf of middle school principals and TechEd teachers, I invite you to visit any of our schools to see our kids and our teachers in action. And um, related to Denise's comment, you'll see a lot of female students in the class and at Prairie Trail, a female teacher. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity, and we would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Is this an elective for the students at the middle school? And is there a limit on how many modules they can take, or is it whatever they can fit into their schedule? Good question. Um, it is an elective course for sixth grade. Sixth grade is a, is a quarter course, so they would finish probably two to three, perhaps, modules up to four during that time. Um, and then um, the capacity on the class would be all of the modules be, would be com completed in seventh grade within that semester course. So there would be approximately 12 modules that they would have the opportunity to complete within that course. So each module then is just a week or two? Seven days. Seven days. Seven. Seven days. Do we track these students? Do a lot of them go on to take 21st century programs in STEM? You know, um, that's been a good question. And Denise has worked on some of those figures, and we could certainly pull those together for you. I'd just be curious to see the students who are in it now, yes. what exposure they had at the middle level. Yes. We do have um, uh, figures, Mrs. Martin, on the students choosing to take it from sixth to seventh grade year, so we could also pull those figures for you, because that's also an interesting sort of picture for our students. So we'd be glad to do that. Thank you. What is the um, overall enrollment? Are, are most of the classes full? Well, I'll let Stacy re refer to that. Okay. You know that um, yes, they are full, and of course, because of the nature of the class and the limited modules, um, there's a, a capacity, a limit in the class, and it's a little smaller in sixth grade than it is actually in the seventh and eighth grade class. But when we were pre preparing for this, and Jeff and I were talking, we have one classroom equipped. Um, but if, if that were not a limitation, if we could equip more than one classroom, I think we could fill um, probably two, at least two teachers' full-time schedules. It's a, it's a very popular class with kids, yes. Other questions? Uh -oh. All right, well, thank you very much. We will move on with the agenda this evening. Previously, we had listed under our consent agenda seven items. Uh, we've added an eighth tonight. It was presented as a future action item last month. It's a student trip. Uh, board members have been made aware of that. So when we uh, make our motion tonight, I'd appreciate 5.01 through 5.08. Uh, having said that, are there any items on this list that board members would like to consider for um, questions or individual consideration? Then I would entertain a motion. Uh, just one point of order, um, Ms. Martin. I, I, it, the item that was left off is really an action item 8.14, not on the consent agenda. It was listed as a future action item last month as 8.14. Got it. Okay, goodness. Mm -hmm. So it is considered a consent item then? Yes. Okay. 
I would move for approval for um, the consent agenda uh, action, I, the items uh, 6.01 through 6.0. I think you mean 5.01? Yeah, 5.01, yeah, through 5.08. Eight. Eight. Second. Ms. Hibbs, I have a motion by Mr. Parker and a second by Mr. Poland. Would you call the roll, please? Yes. Mrs. Felter, whoops, she's not here, I'm sorry. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Ms. Ashley? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Motion carries. Under our action items, 6.01 is the our, our athletic trainer agreement with Olathe Medical Center. Are there any questions or comments? Then I would entertain a motion. I would move to approve the 2013-14 agreement for athletic trainers with the Olathe Medical Center as presented. Second. I have a motion by Dr. Daniels and a second by Ms. Ashley. Would you call the roll? Ms. Ashley? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Mr. Polin? Yes. Motion carries. 6.02, our salary reimbursement agreement with Kids TLC. Questions or comments? Then a motion. <clears throat> I move that we approve the 2013-14 salary reimbursement agreement with Kids TLC as presented. Second. Ms. Tibbs, I have a motion by Ms. Ashley and a second by Mr. Parker. Would you call the roll, please? Mr. Polin? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Ms. Ashley? Yes. Are we going in random order tonight? It's throwing me off a little yeah. bit. <laughs> 6.03, uh, our general insurance policy renewal. Questions or comments? We actually have some information that could be presented and then uh, uh, people who can help answer questions at that time. Excellent, thank you. So I believe Merle Hastert will come. Well, good evening, and thanks for having us this evening. Um, if I remember at this time last year, as we began to present our information on our insurance renewal um, and our premiums for the next year, our instructions were, let's skip the formalities and the introductions, let's get right to the meat and potatoes. So tonight, uh, the premium renewals seem to be just as exciting as last year. <laughs> so we're gonna step back a little bit, and uh, Bob Charlesworth has joined us this evening. He's gonna present some information uh, from uh, some uh, processes that we've gone through this spring in, in recommending to you our premium renewals. Um, I'll be here, Denise Carpenter will be joining us on the workers' comp side, and when Bob finishes his presentation, we'll all be here for questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, thank you for having me. What we did this year is um, we put together a, a summary request for proposal information sent it to some brokers that we felt had some expertise in uh, school districts and had market availability for large property as well as large retention deductible programs in the liability area. Went out and received uh, really two full proposals back. Uh, one through CBiz, uh, there was a letter I believe in your, in your document that said they had a market they felt was gonna be uh, excellent, uh, but the concentration of values uh, of locations was too great for their underwriter at this time. Uh, the other one we got back through Kretcher, Kretcher Heartland. It's a very nice uh, uh, brokerage firm here in uh, Kansas City. What they have done is they put together a program through Lloyd's and then they also put together a not admitted carrier of liability. So we at least had some apples and apples comparisons to look at. Are our rates competitive? Are our values competitive? Are our deductibles competitive? Uh, et cetera. So through the process, we, we've learned quite a bit, as, actually, as a district, on our evaluation process and things we may uh, sh could improve on as we move forward, which was helpful. Uh, Kretcher Heartland actually had some unique ideas within their agency, uh, being able to do maybe some monitoring of certificates of insurance for new construction, uh, facility use, and stuff like that. 
we have a lot of different parts moving here in, in the in the district. So that's something to be cognizant cognizant of uh, moving forward. But th this year we were focusing on the product uh, on the product and and one of the issues last year that I was not happy with was the carrier that that has your current property program offered a larger wind hail deductible more than I would have liked to have seen. And this year, bottom line was, is that that was um, fairly typical of the other quote that we received. We have a hundred thousand dollar deductible that we had to buy down to. The quote was for five hundred thousand for wind hail, which would include tornado. Uh, everything else was a hundred thousand dollar deductible. So at least we saw those those uh, premiums. Uh, but the one carrier wanted our values much higher than where we have them today. Uh, probably somewhere where we have them and where they were wanting is kind of where we need to be and work toward. So I think that was a goal that we need to understand and work toward, uh, which is fine. But bottom line is, is that there's a couple things on our plate today that, we're, that we've proposed that you all consider. One of them is, uh, like we have done this year, uh, we're suggesting that we, uh, first of all, renew a traveler's insurance company. Uh, with buying down the wind hail deductible for five hundred thousand to a hundred thousand. Now there, are, that is a, a separate limit, a separate deductible that would erode if we have multiple events, but it's per occurrence, and we recommend doing that's about thirty-five thousand five hundred dollars, the same amount as it was last year. But the other issues, what we've done, we've actually gone through and have taken some scenarios, and they're not perfect. But what we have done is I actually put together three different scenarios on a, what we call a loss limit because our policy has what we call a $400 million loss limit. It's per occurrence. So the worst case scenario is $400 million. That's the most the insurance company will ever pay in any one occurrence. So the question be begets is, well, where is our stuff at? And what could be taken out in one fell swoop? And then the last two uh, years, as you have known, we've had a horrible loss in Joplin about two years ago now. Uh, recently, we had one in Moore, Oklahoma, which is where I was uh, first living. My wife and I were first married. Uh, the place still stands after two tornadoes, believe it or not. But um, it gets concerning. So what we did is we actually took a model of the tornado the, of Joplin and, and mapped it out over the district's program and gone through what is our worst case scenario. And folks, it's scary. Um, we have concentration of values here in Olathe, neighborhood schools. It's wonderful for our district. but. We have a lot of stuff. <laughs> and so we we're going through all this and we're looking at, you know, worst case, you know, could it be, we have about 83 to 100 million sitting on this corner right here, folks. Uh, you, you take the path that it took in, in Joplin. If it started at ODAC and moved this way, took out of late the South, some elementary schools, we're going to probably over $300 million in one fell swoop. We're currently at 400 million. What we do have as an option today is we have an option to move that to 500 million. Uh, and, it, and the premium uh, uh, is $35,000 for that as well. We are recommending that we do that uh, based on the concentration of values and just um, the risk that we, we could have. Uh, we think it's very prudent to do that. So that was one area. The other area was the liability. Actually, we have a $200,000 deductible essentially on the liability. We've had that for several years. Um, we like that because it's just what we call a self-insured retention, which actually gives the right of the district to really manage their claim from dollar one instead of hanging off to an insurance company to manage it and maybe sell it when you might not have wanted to settle it. So it's legal liability. We had that large deductible. Uh, but actually, the premium went down, uh, which I haven't seen in a liability program. So uh, thanks to Thomas McGee for being the broker on that and being very aggressive at getting that price for us. And so that's one of the issues we're looking at. And of course, along with that, we need an independent third party administrator to handle those claims of which we can't handle as a district. Usually they involve large property or uh, bodily injury type claims. Uh, we do not want to get into the claim handling business of that. So we hire a third party and Thomas McGee does that. And as you can see, the estimated cost for that's about $8,415 a year. Uh, the other ancillary lines are uh, we really don't want to touch the crime, which is employee dishonesty. Uh, that went up just a little bit in premium. And then we have a fiduciary liability through Chubb. Um, that's, uh, we actually uh, pick folks that handle uh, our employees' monies. <laughs> so we actually have a fiduciary responsibility uh, for that. And as you can see, that went from 2500 to 2750 for an annual premium. 
So collectively on the property and liability program, uh, we were very pleased with Thomas McGee coming back with a very strong program with incumbent. Uh, I was very pleased with Crusher Hartland coming back with, uh, obviously something to compare with was, I thought was important, but also uh, services that a broker can bring and some answer things that we might want to look at in the future. Uh, but collectively, what we're looking at today is the product. And bottom line is this, in, in a nutshell, renewal with travelers on the property program, uh, increasing the loss limit to 500,000, excuse me, 500 million per loss. Also buying the deductible buy-down buy from 500,000 to 100,000 for wind hail. Uh, accepting the liability program with Genesis uh, with a $200,000 retention. Uh, accepting the third-party administration fee with, with Thomas McGee for 8,415 estimated because uh, it's based on the uh, annual occurrences of claims. Looking at crime uh, again for uh, 5729 and fiduciary liability for 2750. So kind of as an entire package, property and liability, that's what we're recommending the district consider for this year. Thank you. Board members, questions? I have a question about where do we go in the future uh, with the increasing occurrence of, of severe weather? And I am asking you to pull out your crystal ball and offer some suggestions. Um, well, Mr. Ashley, that's a good question, and it's a tough one to answer. Um, the, the, the easiest answer from a risk manager's point of view, if you want to pull out a textbook, and I like teaching <coughs> risk management, uh, not textbook risk management, though, uh, you, sh you don't build buildings close to each other. <laughs> you spread the risk. Okay. Uh, but that doesn't serve the community very well sometimes. So sometimes the best book is not necessarily the best on paper. Um, spreading the concentration of values obviously is a big deal. The construction itself is huge. Uh, obviously the, the construction that the district has is uh, excellent. Uh, the extra money that you all have through bonds, through uh, updates and stuff like that is huge. I think the strong construction that you have is probably the biggest key uh, for damages, uh, obviously, if a tornado hits it, it's gonna, it's gonna hit it. Uh, there's not much you can do that. But for all the others, we have very few property losses in this district, and the Mossman's we have, the service center does a phenomenal job getting them back up and running. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I don't have a good answer for you on that. I think just the spreading of risk, watching the concentration of values at any one location, and you know, we have a, we have a builder's risk program right now that's part of our program. Uh, probably ought to talk about that. You know, we have automatic coverage for buildings that we have, we do additions to. There's automatic coverage for that. Uh, at least quarterly, I know the uh, Thomas McGee, folks at Thomas McGee, the brokerage firm, uh, visit with Merle and get a quarterly update on all projects going on. So that builder's risk is always updated. And we have some automatic coverage provisions on the property policy for new construction that if we happen to miss a, a timing of 20 or 30, or actually we have 90 days, I think, or maybe 120 on your policy. We have 120 days on your policy. Uh, so we have a million dollars of automatic coverage and that's still just getting groundwork done, stuff being brought on site. So we have a lot of good things going within our insurance policy as we have as we continue to grow as a district. I probably didn't answer your question specifically, but. It was helpful, thank you. You bet. I think it would be important for, for the public to understand that, you know, the extra in the, in our staff as well, because this comes out of our general fund. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the extra 35,000 for the 400, the extra hundred million of coverage on our, our cap and also the extra 400,000, uh, in our deductible, that's $70,000, but we're buying 100 million, $400,000 worth of coverage for $70,000. And that makes Mr. Hutchison feel really good. It makes Bob Charles feel very well uh, too, by because, the way. <laughs> because those losses, if 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 we if, if our losses were greater than than our insurance or the four hundred thousand, if we had one occurrence and we had a it was a million dollar loss and we had to come up with an extra four hundred thousand, again that comes out of our general fund, and again that's teacher salaries and that's classroom instruction. So uh, this seventy thousand dollars is money that is very well spent, and it's good protection for the district. I I agree. Um, and I think it's also important for the for the public to understand and our teachers as well that that other bid from, from the other bid that we got. You asked two brokers, Seabridge, who declined to even offer a bid. They didn't they didn't have the, a market. In other words, they didn't have any carrier that wanted to write our policy. Mm -hmm. So they passed, 
entirely. And then the bid we got from Kretcher Heartland was 992,000 and our package now is 700,000 and change. So even though we bid it, uh, they were 270,000 more than what we're currently paying. So again, the public and our teachers can understand that we've done due diligence on this and we've gotten the best product at the best price. We have a very good product. Uh, this year, our, we really were focusing on the product and I'm very happy with the product that the district has right now. Yeah, yeah and it's it, and uh, Mr. Shear and I were in the committee, and it, it, it's it's difficult for us to spend that thirty five thousand dollars for that four hundred thousand of coverage, uh, but that's per per occurrence. And if we had two two occurrences, that's eight hundred thousand uh, dollars. So it, it, again, it we we believe that it'd be no. We it's our recommendation that we would go ahead and accept that and buy that deductible, that wind hail deductible down to, to 100000 rather than being 500000 for the $35,000 of premium. That is correct. Okay. And I just want everybody to understand what, what our thinking <clears throat> on that is and um, uh, that we're just not by spending $35,000 here willy-nilly. So. Not at all. In fact, yeah. after my review of information, I, I, I just get very uncomfortable where we're at today. I, the extra $100 million to me is extremely important yeah. for the district to consider especially. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your comments. Okay. Yeah, we would we would look real a hundred million dollar foolish if we didn't spend that thirty five thousand dollars for that additional. Mr. Parker, million I, I don't like giving insurance companies a dollar. Yeah. So, but uh, <laughs> to me, you know, to me that yeah. you know, based on and especially for what Kretcher Hartland provided us, they had an eight hundred million dollar loss limit. Now it's it's a different. It's kind of a pool program. They had different silos for different uh, entities of which they have. Uh, very good concept, but it's, you know, we need to probably get the values up a little bit. Their actually rate per hundred was higher than where we're at today. We have a competitive product. Mm -hmm. Right. Dr. Barry, I don't remember ever seeing a presentation on our risk management program. We may have, but uh, I'd, I'd like some information on that sometime. Do that? Sure. Then I would move to accept the fiscal year 2013-14 quotes for property liability, wind hail deductible buy down, general liability, TPA services, crime liability, and fiduciary liability as presented. Second. Ms. Hibbs, I have a motion by Mr. Parker and a second by Mr. Shear. Would you call the roll, please? Mr. Shear? Yes. Ms. Ashley? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Polin? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Motion carries 6.04, our workers' compensation excess insurance policy and third-party administrator contract. Mr. Charlesworth is still there, so I assume you have something else to present. Uh, just one quick uh, item on this. Um, the uh, two pieces, as you mentioned, uh, Mrs. Martin, the first one is the stop loss and in insurance that we do purchase as a district. Currently, we're at $350,000 per accident. Um, the premium of that came back, uh, it went up fairly well. Uh, you may remember last year I gave you all kudos to, for buying a two-year rate <laughs> and that expired unfortunately so now it's time to kind of get back caught up a little bit. But in reality what we're looking at is moving that to a $400,000 per accident retention uh, and this actually gives us a two-year program knowing the rate for the renewal as well as the rate for the next year. And I have not seen that before. So that's a very good. It's with Safety National. That's our current stop loss carrier. Um, we have approval from the state to do this already. Uh, if the board so chooses to move up, you have to get their approval for these, these issues. Uh, Ed Treadwell from Thomas McGee has already got that approval from them if you all move to, to go this way. Um, based on our loss history, we have only had one claim, uh, and that was in uh, 2003. Is that right? 2003, that's been over 300000 and that hasn't been fully paid yet. Some of that's in reserve. So, you know, yes, it's a risk, but it's also per accident, not per individual. So um, we're recommending it's based on the premium to save the premium there and move to that new retention level. And also renew the contract with Thomas McGee. It is up a little bit. Um, they asked for rating uh, premium or fee increase. Um, they haven't had a rating fee increase in three years. And um, I think it's due. Comments or questions? 
So again, basically what, what we're saying here is that currently our, our, our he, uh, Mr. Char uh, Charles was called to the stop loss deductible. Basically, basically it's our deductible yes, on sir. work comp of 350000 So we're recommending to raise that deductible to 400000 You say, now wait a minute, we just spent 70000 to buy more insurance and now this, that 50000 we saved $16,000 worth of premium. So by save, by Going to 400000 we save 16000 and our loss exposure on that is, as Mr. Charles was mentioned, one, one claim in the last 10 years has been greater than 300000 I don't think we've ever gone, have we ever gone over the three fifty. No. So we've never gone over. So there, that's that's good a good buy on our part. We're buying. We're basically we're giving up fifty thousand dollars worth of coverage for sixteen thousand dollars, and that's like a three year payback on that. And a second year known rate on right. our stop loss mm -hmm. is a good so, deal. So we're getting back sixteen thousand of that seventy thousand. First year. First year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and to address Mr. Poland's comment a minute ago by risk management, uh, I actually do attend the monthly meetings, the uh, the safety committee meetings for the district. Yeah. Uh, they're very spirited. Uh, we go to different uh, locations all the time. We <laughs> actually, well, that's a good thing to say. Uh, uh, we actually get to tour it, and we get to meet the folks there. Uh, uh, both the safety rep there as well as the, the custodial staff because uh, they're there every day. We're not. And it's really good to, to see and be seen. And the committee gets to see the building. Uh, and so when we talk about things that happen, they can say, I remember what that facility looks like. And um, they're not that long, but they're very, I think they're very impactful. And again, to speak to that, uh, our safety record, if you look at our rate uh, per thousand at .0437, that, that's unheard of. That's good. Yeah, that's really good. And if we went to the open market with that, they would double if we were not self-insured. So speaking about the self-insured part of that, um, we talked a little bit about this last year, and it's something that we kind of kind of scoot under the rug, but it's something that we need to be aware of, and that is how we're reserved in our work comp self-insured pool. And and we we keep that pretty slend, slender. Actuarially, it probably is not right if we were looking at actuarially, but it works because of our good loss, our good risk management. But if we had a couple of big claims, we would might find ourselves in a situation where we would have to put some more money in our reserve fund out of the general fund on a transfer. So this year, when we do transfers, if there's any money left over, we should think about trying to transfer a little bit extra money into our work comp reserve because that needs a little bit of help. It's not in dire straits, but it's on the edge. <laughs> Charles, do you have, it, with that in mind, self-insuring, do you have that number off the top of your head, what we would be paying as a premium if we didn't self-insure? Uh, it's, 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 it's going to be a ballpark. Uh, but it, my last time I did it was like $994,000 a year. So it's around a million dollars a year if we had to go out and write a check for it every year. And so, again, these are the things that the board continues to try to do and look at different levers of being able to mm -hmm. save the taxpayers' money, and this is just one of those options for us right now. And, and really, you know, the, the district employs themselves. They, <coughs> they understand it's district money uh, at the annual in-service that we have. The, the, it always, Denise does a wonderful job of going over, these are our dollars as a, as a district. We're responsible for our patrons. Right. And they understand that. And the return to work is great. Uh, the staff uh, with, with Denise, they get people back when they need to. And the, and the folks, your employees out there, try and accommodate the best they can to get them back because we want them to work. Right. And this so. is all a teamwork. This is everybody Absolutely. from the worker to the people that are injured and getting them all back is the one that's saving us almost a million dollars a year. Absolutely. I think it's huge. Yeah. Well, then, then, our, then our limit uh, per claim is the million. Over and, above, over and above the three hundred, the four hundred thousand. No, actually, it's the, statutory. Then the, whatever the statute has is that's what that's it is. What, that's what the carrier would, what Safety National would pay. Then that's correct. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Basically, Safety National should really love us because they haven't paid a claim in years, have they? <laughs> they have not. <laughs> That's why our premium is so low. Yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah. Uh, may, maybe on the East Coast, may, they might not like that so, statement so well. But yeah. Uh, um, yeah. But it's good to have that backup, knowing that if you got that big one, you're not going to have to go to the general fund to Absolutely. fund a, a million dollar claim, of, un, unfortunately, fatality or something of that nature. And with the statutory benefit, I'm not sure the state would allow you to go without something. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Yeah. Are we ready for a motion? 
I'd move to approve the 2013-2014 workers' compensation excess insurance renewal and third-party administrator contract for workers' compensation administration as presented. Second. Ms. Hibbs, I have a motion by Mr. Poland and a second by Mr. Shear. Would you call the roll, please? Dr. Daniels. Yes. Mrs. Martin. Yes. Mr. Shear. Yes. Mr. Parker. Yes. Mr. Poland. Yes. Ms. Ashley. Yes. Motion carries 6.05 uh, furniture bids for our elementary renovations. Comments or questions? Then I would entertain a motion. I move to approve the furniture bids for the four elementary renovations as presented. Second. <coughs> Ms. Hibbs, I have a motion by Mr. Shear and a second by Ms. Ashley. Would you call the roll, please? Ms. Ashley. Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Polin? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. The motion carries. 6.06 uh, trade bids for the Technology Support Center and Food Production Center additions. Comments or questions? Then I would entertain a motion. Move to approve the bids listed in the bid summary and reject the food service equipment bids as presented. Second. Ms. Hibbs, I have a motion by Mr. Parker and a second by Mr. Shear. Would you call the roll, please? Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Mr. Polin? Yes. Ms. Ashley? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. So when does the work begin? We're ready. They'll be there uh, right away, instantly. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> 6.07 our milk based products and juice bids. Comments or questions? I move to approve the escalating pricing option offered by Highland Dairy for milk based products and 100% juice products as presented. Second. <clears throat> Ms. Hibbs, I have a motion by Dr. Daniels and a second by Mr. Poland. Would you call the roll, please? Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Ms. Ashley? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Motion carries. 6.08 Apple iPad purchase. Comments or questions? Can we get a little bit of an update of, because this is the second phase of this, the second one, talk a little bit about how it's been accepted, how we're using them now, um, how well is it working? So which part of that do you want me to start just with? A, just an overall <laughs> executive summary of it, because, because this, is, this is neat technology for us. And this is. is something that the kids have at home. It's nice that we're finally getting into the school. So I just want to kind of have, have a reinforcement of it from that standpoint. Phase one uh, kind of wrapped up this spring when we had presentations by several of the groups that had received the iPads. And they were really kind of scattered across the district, across grade levels, across curriculums. We had quite a few at ELL. Jan Heinen is here. If you have any questions on how that worked at ELL, I, I know she has some very positive things. We got great things back from ELL, from SPED. We had them in high school PE. We had them at um, primary grade levels. And we just had a great response from all of the people that presented. Um, didn't really come up with one um, area that was really a driving force to us that said, wow, that had the biggest impact for example, in ELL, and that's where we should go with all of these. They were really uh, so broad across the spectrum that we really wanted to just continue to allow buildings to purchase as they saw need to, a need for it in their buildings with their building funds. So that's kind of where phase two is going. Uh, a few less iPads than we had with phase one. Phase one also included iPads for uh, district administration, so that kind of uh, increased those numbers a little bit. But I, I think in some respects, people were kind of a little bit reluctant to spend a whole lot of money with iPads right now, hoping that our bond passes and we have a more focused uh, influx of technology at all the grade levels. So. This is just kind of a continuation. They're really spread again ac across all curricular levels. I can tell you that uh, a large majority of them are really going into the hands of students. Um, 
but again, just it's been successful. It's been very well received. A lot of people wanting more and more and more, and we really hope to give them that in the future. Sure. How are they holding up, especially in the classroom? Are we having very many damaged? You know, we buy Apple Care Plus with the iPad. Uh, it covers accidental damage twice on each machine. <laughs> we have probably only had to send back maybe 10 to 12 of the 400 that were purchased in phase one. Uh, we also buy a pretty heavy duty case for the iPads that go into the students' hands. They're called an otter box, if you mm -hmm. know anything about those. Um, they're, they're, the case really protects the iPad and we've really had very little loss. Actually, I was a little bit surprised that it's as low as it's been, but it's been very good. People are very respectful. They're very excited to get them, so they wanna make sure they take good care of them. Would you like to make a motion? I would. To approve the purchase of 290 iPads from Apple Inc. for $132,820. Second. Ms. Hibbs, I have a motion by Mr. Scheer and a second by Mr. Poland. Would you call the roll, please? Dr. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Ashley? Yes. Mr. Scheer? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. The motion carries. I would like to stop where we are right now, take our comfort break. I would invite everyone to go out to the lobby where we will be having a reception for Ms. Ashley, punching cookies out there. You can go out and wish her well. Um, and then we'll be back here at 7 o'clock. Welcome back, everyone. We have a full room tonight, so if you guys all want to kind of scooch this way, we'll make some more room at the door for everyone to filter in. Next on our agenda, we do our awards and recognitions, and tonight Dr. Aaron Dugan and Mr. Rick Shearer are going to be assisting with that. Good evening, everyone. We are a packed room, but welcome. We're very excited. We have some wonderful recognitions um, to share with our Board of Education and our, our distinguished guests here this evening. I want to begin our recognition tonight with a valued business partner. Um, I'd like to ask Heather Schoonover from Community Development and Cindy Von Felt from the Olathe Public Schools Foundation to head forward to help us with this recognition. Uh, additionally, I'd like to ask Lori Menard and Nikki Thomas, both representing Garmin, to also come forward. Hi, Cindy. Tonight, we recognize Garmin, who brings innovative opportunities to elate the public schools. Let me highlight just a few of the many ways Garmin supports our district. Garmin has provided student internship opportunities, mentored students, provided guest presenters, provided workplace exploration tours, which means they let us go over and look at the Garmin building, which is awesome. Um, they've partnered with our adopt school program, both at Indian Trail and our summer enrichment program at Santa Fe Trail. Um, huge contributors to the Olathe Public Schools Foundation, supporting Rachel's Challenge, Teachers Excellence Grants, the Classified Staff Recognition Program, and all, has also provided leadership on the board of directors uh, for the foundation, and we're thrilled for that. Tonight, we recognize the Garmin team uh, that has been instrumental to the partnership with our school district. Uh, Lori Menard is here, Vice President of Human Resources at Garmin, and Nikki Thomas, College Relations Recruiter. It's a great title. Um, so <laughs> on behalf of the, the school district, thank you to Garmin and you guys specifically for all you do and all you partner with us. We appreciate you. I'm going to change order up here a little bit to accommodate some schedules, but for our next recognition, we ask that Vanya Shivashankar, along with her principal, Connie V. Brock, head forward. <laughs> I 
Vanya, you are already famous by the crowd and the clapping, but let me tell someone that maybe didn't uh, catch this uh, breaking news, but uh, Vanya is a sixth grader at California Trail. She has just returned from the 86th Annual Scripps Spelling Bee, which was held last week in National Harbor, Maryland. At the National Bee, Vanya was nothing short of spectacular, making it to the nationally televised finals on ESPN, where she tied fifth in the nation. Wow. Vanya earned the right to compete at the National Spelling Bee for the third time after winning the qualifying Spelling Bee sponsored uh, here in Olathe by the Olathe uh, News. Uh, congratulations to Vanya for her ongoing success, both locally and at the National Spelling Bees. Your talent and absolute happy spirit makes us incredibly proud here in the Olathe <laughs> School District. Uh, we give her uh, an, any winner of our local uh, Spelling Bee. It's um, Vanya, I want, if you can, let me know who's here. Let us know who's here from your family and so we can recognize them and all their support. Thank you, Vanya. Next, I'd like to recognize Sunnyside Elementary School and ask that David Kearney, principal of Sunnyside, Marvely Collins, Sunnyside School Counselor, and Larry Katziff, who has facilitated our K-12 counseling program, to please come forward. Sunnyside Elementary was awarded the Standard of Excellence Award for the 2012-2013 school year by the Kansas State Department of Education. This award recognizes Sunnyside for demonstrating a high degree of alignment with the Kansas Comprehensive School Counseling Model and the multi-tiered system of support in their school counseling program. Uh, in addition, Sunnyside was one of just a few of the schools in the state of Kansas to receive the 2013 Spotlight Award uh, from the Kansas Department of Education. The Spotlight Award is recognizing schools who achieve the state's social, emotional, and character development standards. Um, a huge congratulations to Sunnyside Elementary. We're in a recognizing counseling mode. So next we want to recognize the school counselor at Ravenwood Elementary School. We ask that Karen Thompson, the counselor at Ravenwood, to come uh, up to the front and bring with her Ravenwood Principal Jim Brockway and also Larry Katz who's going to stay put up front. Karen Thompson was the district nominee for the 2012-2013 School Counselor of the Year and was the finalist for the Kansas School Counselor of the Year Award by the Kansas School Counselor Association. Congratulations, Karen, and thank you for all that you do for students and families both at Ravenwood and throughout our school district. Um, a huge thank you. Um, and let us know, family members in the audience, you can recognize? My best friend and my husband is here. Aww. Well, there you go. Wow. Awesome. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Get ready for students. Here we go. Culinary. Very exciting. We'd like to now recognize the district's culinary program and ask that Connie Neiman, Patty McWilliams, and the members of the Olathe North culinary team please come forward along with Olathe North Principal David Morford and Kathy Musgrave, our Career and Technical Education Administrator. Once again, they came with us. For the eighth, and I think I have that right, eighth year in a row, our culinary team swept the culinary competition of the Kansas State Pro Start Competition 
and for the fifth year in a row, represent the state of Kansas at the National Pro Start Competition. The team took fourth place at national competition. Additionally, the management team took first in the state of Kansas and 12th at the national competition. Members of the culinary team, Dylan Magaster, Jose Hernandez, Kayla Daniels, Morgan Gibbs, and members of the management team, Gabrielle Van Hoot, Kayla Vermullen, sorry, Olivia Glover, and Cody Kaufman. Is Kayla here? Yeah. Say your last name. It's close. Yeah. Just, I, I gave it a couple extra pieces. We're thrilled you're here. Uh, Chef Mike, who we typically bring up, and so folks that are used to this, um, is not here this evening. Uh, he is in Moore, Oklahoma, and he is cooking for a leaf worker. So we're thrilled he's there and miss him here tonight, though. Uh, congratulations to the Olathe Culinary Program. Um, your ongoing success at state and national competition uh, makes us incredibly proud. Um, again, if you're a family member in the audience for any one of these lovely people, um, stand up and give us a chance to recognize you. Thank you. Olathe North shouldn't go too far. The Olathe North Science Olympiad team experienced tremendous success this year, and we'd now like to recognize them. Would the members of the team please come forward, along with Coach Sherry Hansen, and again, Principal David Morford, and Activities Director Chad Breckheisen. Olathe North won the state championship at the State Science Olympiad Tournament in Wichita, Kansas this spring. As a result, they attended the national competition at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio in May. The members of the team who won an award at nationals are, and give me a little wave and I'll apologize in advance on any names, uh, Gregory Bixler won a sixth place medal in Rocks and Minerals. Thanks, Gregory. Christoph Kinzel won a fifth place medal in Material Science. Drew Broadbent won a fifth place medal in material science and a sixth place medal in rocks and materials. Other members of the team, and incredibly important, so wave if I call your name as well, Alexandria Fiscus, Andrew Johannesson, Annalise Kohler, Mark LaFollette, that can't be right, Brendan Porter, <laughs> Kavya Shivashankar, Timothy Weber, Michael Johnson, Natasha Graham, Marissa Madeira, David Nelson, Mark Vrieblick, Cooper Yerby, Disha Descupta, Roshan Basaria, Griffin Carr. Congratulations to all the members of the Olathe North Science Lipid team. Again, if you're a family or just a proud fan of any of these folks, stand up and let us recognize you. Awesome. From Science Olympiad to bowling, we're now going to want to recognize an outstanding member of the Olathe Northwest bowling team. I ask that Mackenzie Saulnier and assistant bowling coach Kristen Potter please come forward with Dr. Gwen Poss, who looks a lot like Jay Novacek, uh, <laughs> assistant principal at Olathe Northwest High School. This is a great story. This year, Mackenzie Saulnier, a sophomore at Northwest, won the Kansas State Bowling title with a 707 series. Mackenzie won the competition by 44 pins over the second place finisher by grabbing control of the competition with a 266 in her second game. Wow. It's important to note at the regional completion, Mackenzie took first place, get ready, with an 804 series 
with scores of 234, 290, and 280. <laughs> We're just all going to pause on that and moan. <laughs> Huge congratulations to Mackenzie on this outstanding postseason performance. Um, introduce, if you can, some proud family members. Sorry, go on. <laughs> state softball. Let's now recognize the 2013 state champions in softball. I ask that the Olathe East softball team, including head coach Jeff Hulse and assistant principal Ryan Ralston, come to the front of the room. It's a bunch of chatty high school girls, but I'm going to interrupt them for a minute and maybe do the... Um, you may recognize, actually, our audience, recognize some of these girls, and for a good reason. This represents the second state championship in a row, so for some of them, they were here probably about this time uh, last year. This also represents the eighth softball championship for Olathe East since the school opened in 1992. And also, this continues Olathe's dominance in softball, with district high schools winning the state championship four of the last five years and seven out of the last ten years. Additionally, softball is the only sport that all four high schools have won a state championship. Hmm. Also, kind of breaking news, Allison Stewart here. Wave. Oh, there, that's Allison. <laughs> Busy chatting. Uh, just named the Gatorade Player of the Year for the state of Kansas, so a special shout out. <laughs> Girls, I'm going to attempt to call out your name, and you're going to do that super softball wave so the audience can recognize. So, members of the team include Elizabeth Leonard, Maddie Augustine, Kelsey, I won't get it right, Gertsema, close, Greer Hartman, Bailey Ward. Taylor Officer, Kaylee Byers, Kennedy Poro, Taylor Vickers, Amber Halberton, Jenny Brooks, McKenna Davis, Allison Stewart, Emily Voigt, and Sadie Wooten. Got him? Wooten. Wooten. <laughs> woo woo Wooten. That's it. The student managers are Lee Thomas and Kelly Carney. The assistant coaches are Stan Sperlin, Shelly Shaw, and Sarah Batchelet. Head coach is Jeff Hulse. And Jeff, you're going to introduce someone else that I didn't list. This is Ryan Ralston, the administrator okay. for the East. Awesome. Right, Good. Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations to the the East uh, Hawks, uh, Kansas State champions again. Um, and let's recognize any family that's out there. Please stand up and let us clap for you guys. <laughs> Our final and very important recognitions for this evening, I want to recognize all of our state champions in track and field. We would like all the student athletes and their coaches who won a state championship in an individual event at the state track and field meet to come forward. Um, along with the following principals and their athletic directors, Ryan Ralston from Olathe East, David Morford from Olathe North, Jay Novacek from Northwest, Phil Clark and Robert Kersey from Olathe South.
We had a number of track and field individual state champions, as you can see, and Ann's going to have a great time trying to get them all in a picture, so they can already start thinking about it. Let's start with Olathe East. From Olathe East, we have Jasmine Thomas, a junior, wave, who won the state championship in both the 100-meter dash with a time of 12.24 and the 200-meter dash with a time of 26.64. Kelsey Queering, also a junior who won the 800 meter run with a time of two minutes and 21.47 seconds. And the four by 400 meter relay team of Kyle Evans, Nick Henricks, Braxton Love and Parker Evans, all juniors. They won the four by 400 meter relay with a time of three minutes and 22.9 seconds. Mm. And last from Olathe East, and certainly not least, Kayla Neal, a junior who won the triple jump with a distance of 46 feet and 11.75 inches. Congratulations to Olathe East. <laughs> From Olathe North, Kai Sheen was unable to make it tonight unless he snuck in on me. Uh, a junior who won the high jump with a height of six feet, eight inches. So we're very excited <coughs> there. From Olathe Northwest, we have Cameron Geldner, a freshman who won the 3200 meter run with a time of 11 minutes and 17.63 seconds. Cameron, did you wave so they all saw you? There she is. There she is. Congratulations, Cameron. That's awesome. <laughs> From Olathe South, we have Tanner Green, who I also think could not be here this evening, but let's recognize a sophomore who won the 200-meter dash with a time of 22.4. <laughs> the 4 by 100 meter relay team of Aaron Thacker, Dresden Wilbur, Tanner Green, and Chris Coleman with a time of 42 minutes and 11 seconds. And Braden Smith. 42 seconds. 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 <laughs> 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 the rear of the 4 by 100. No. Absolutely. I'm going to do that again with a time of four minutes. 42 seconds. You should see what it says here. This is <laughs> by our district athletic director, so we'll visit later. <laughs> In an incredible time, a huge hand to that team. <laughs> and very quickly, Brayden Smith, who couldn't be here tonight, a junior who won both the shot put, and I hope this is correct, with the distance of 57 feet and 3.1 inches, and the discus with a distance of 188 feet even. I got that one right. And awesome. Uh, Late the South, congratulations to you guys. <laughs> Let's congratulate all of these athletes in track and field, and then also recognize some family and fans that I know are in the audience. And some are already standing up. <laughs> About anybody can. Better. Thank you. Take a nap in between. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice nap. Big smile. Walking in that. Individual student certificates. Coaches are going to give those to you. They're out by the front desk, so don't leave without those. And a huge congratulations. And Board of Education, that concludes our recognitions for tonight. At this time, we'd like to do a special recognition for Rita Ashley. Uh, tonight is her last regular board meeting. Rita, would you join me up here, please? Mm. Of course. <laughs> Are there any more surprises? <laughs> A lot's happened. Oh, there's a surprise right back there. Everybody, everybody wave to Anna. Uh, this is Rita's granddaughter, Anna. And I think the real reason that she's leaving us. 
A lot has happened in Olathe in the past eight years, and serving as a member of this board has certainly kept Rita Ashley on her toes. We've added a few students, we've hired a few superintendents, we've opened a few buildings, we've sold a few bonds. Rita's tenure on the school board has seen a period of continued increases in student achievement, despite the challenges that come with changing demographics and mammoth budget cuts. And Rita, I hope that's something that you're incredibly proud of. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> You've served with professionalism and dedication. You're a consummate networker. And I'm amazed at the work you've done on behalf of the district, forging relationships with other school districts and with the business community. <laughs> you've never hesitated to speak your mind or stand <laughs> your ground on the issues that are important to you. And you've always been a champion for our music and our fine arts programs. We know your life won't be the same without the long hours spent preparing for meetings, and the phone calls and the emails from concerned parents or maybe the drives to Topeka for KASB activities. Uh, but we hope you'll think of us every once in a while, perhaps when you're enjoying a concert at the Kaufman, or an evening at a jazz club with friends, or maybe on one of your long walks with Anna. We're going to miss you, Rita, very much. And on behalf of all the board, I'd like to thank you for your service to our district and for this entire community. As we recognize Rita tonight for her service on the Olathe Board of Education, we don't want to make it this is your life kind of program, but as individual board members, you do bring your personal life and experiences to the whole group. Rita has shared in the past about her small district experience growing up in north central Kansas. Her hometown district was not a story of enrollment growth and boundary changes, as she has shared with us that the same 17 kids went her class all through school. <laughs> Everyone knew each other. But Rita has very much been a, a part of our very large district for the past eight years. I, of course, personally love the story that Rita has received her own education at the University of Kansas and is a proud Jayhawk. Some may not realize that Rita started out to be a teacher before moving into the world of finance and banking. Rita was first elected to the Board of Education in the spring of 2006 and took her seat for the first board meeting on July 5th, 2006. Tonight is her 175th board meeting. It didn't take, <laughs> that, that really hits pretty hard, doesn't it, 175. It didn't take Rita long to get involved either, as she was appointed the KESB governmental relations contact the very first month. I think she's enjoyed the legislative and association work from her board seat during her tenure. As a board member of eight years, she's been involved in the growth and excellence of our school district. She's been on the board to open nine buildings. She was a part of the 6-9 reconfiguration of grades for our district. She was on the board when we began televising our meetings. She was on the board when the Mill Creek Bond Task Force was formed, and she was on the board for the 07, 08, and 2013 bond issues. She was involved in the action as part of the AVID program. She made the motion to begin a limited elementary international language pilot. So as you can tell, she's been a very active, very dedicated board member, serving on many KESB committees and boards, as well as many district committees. Whether it's been communications, finance, construction, or any other committee, Rita has been informed and insightful in her contribution. One or two Thursday nights a month for the past eight years, Rita has made the Olathe School District and the Board of Education her focus and work, and we are truly grateful the contributions that you've made to the work of preparing our students for the future, and for that, Rita, we thank you. Thank you for the recognition. Um, it's, it's been quite a ride. And when I think back on it, and, and I said to someone outside, I said, I don't know how you begin to describe this experience. And I assume that the rest of the board members will kind of feel the same way when and if they decide to leave the board. But I, I sort of came around to a couple of words that really seem appropriate. And those are, it's been gratifying and it's been worthwhile. And I want to thank the staff of the school district. You, you've all been wonderful from the top down to 
you know, everybody who's in the schools doing all the things that they do. Everybody's been wonderful and supportive. I appreciate people coming up to me when I'm out in the community. People I don't know in the school district will say, oh, it's so good to see you, Mrs. Ashley. I teach at such and such a school in this grade. And, and I really do appreciate that kind of feedback. I, I thank the people in the community who supported me when I have been elected. And I also thank the people who disagreed with me and disagreed with the board, because it's good for us to hear other opinions and, and other points of view. It helps us make better decisions. Um, I want to thank my fellow board members. You guys have been a terrific group to work with. The diversity on the board makes us stronger, helps us make better decisions, and I have every bit of confidence that they're going to continue to provide great leadership for the district, and I know that they will mentor my successor, Brent McCune, and, and will be an awesome school district. There are some things that really are kind of significant for me, and you're probably going to say, well, gee, when I get done, that you've forgotten this and you've forgotten that. But one of the things that's really stood out for me the last few years is being connected to site councils in the school district. And I really am so happy that we implemented that program and regret that maybe I didn't attend as many meetings as I had intended to. But I tried to get to all the schools I was connected to at least once during the year. But it's been so beneficial to connect with the leadership in those schools, to connect with the people who are on those site councils to learn about the issues, to learn about the concerns, to learn about the successes that are going on in different parts of the school district. And I think we bring those back to the board then when we make those, those decisions. I, I really like the idea that we've organized committees and we've got board members sitting on committees and they can kind of study in depth the, the issues that are going on and bring those back to the rest of the board, just as Mr. Parker did tonight in regard to, to insurance. I like the, the way we've expanded our communications in the district, sending out hard copy newsletters. I know this is the age of electronics and social media, but there's still a certain contingent out there that appreciates those hard copies, and so I'm glad that, that we're doing that. I'm excited at the possibility of a fifth high school. I know that's not a for sure yet, and we're going to know, what is it, a week from, or no, we know Tuesday, whether that's, that's going to succeed, but that's really pretty exciting because there's a great need for us. And, I'm really sort of glad I'm not going to have to make the boundary decisions for that. <laughs> of course, I was a great supporter for the reconfiguration. Uh, I, I believed in that from the day that we started that initiative, and I'm so pleased that we've been able to implement that. I think it's been good for our school district. And as Mrs. Martin mentioned, been a great supporter of the arts, and I'm really glad that we've been able to implement a program so we can repair instruments and keep more of our students involved in the classroom. And gosh, with our enrollment up 30 plus percent in music programs. That's really a, a testimonial to how important those are. So last of all, uh, I don't want to embarrass him, but I do want to say thank you to Dr. Barry. He is very responsive to board members. He's been a great superintendent to work with, and he's a great leader for this district. And um, I know that you'll continue to do great things. I guess in, in parting, I would just comment on one of the speeches that a senior gave at Olathe Northwest two years ago. And the theme of her whole presentation was, are we there yet? <laughs> and the idea was that, gee, don't forget about the journey and the experiences that you have, getting so focused on the goal that you don't recognize what is going on in between and the experiences that you have that you can learn from. And I think that kind of describes the Olathe School District, because we don't know <laughs> where this is going. We just continue to have growth, and we come up with new ideas. And, and do bigger and better things for the school district. And I think that so describes us. And, and asking that question, are we there yet? And the answer is no. So just continue to, to do all the good things that you're doing. I am immensely proud of this district. And I'm so proud to have served on the Board of Education. Thank you. As part of recognizing Rita tonight, I, I want to mention that I've always been sensitive to the fact that former board members just drop off of our team. It sounds like a punchline to a really bad joke, what happens to board members when they leave. <laughs> board members certainly have their memories and their stories from their time on the board, and their actions are recorded in board minutes forever. But I don't want their names and work to ever be forgotten. The Olathe School District has a rich legacy of wonderful board members. And so tonight we are unveiling a framed document that will hang right outside this boardroom that contains the names of all board members and their years of service back to the consolidation of our district. Interesting. 
I've done this in a previous district and found that people enjoyed looking at the names when they come in. They would notice names of people that they know, that they go to church with, that maybe live down the street, and they'll say, I never knew that you were on the Board of Education. So in recognition tonight of Rita's service and the service of all former board members in the Olathe Public School District, I'm pleased to provide this permanent recording that will hang outside the main door of this boardroom. Awesome. Good. That's great. Oh, Thank nice. you. Yeah. Wow. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> I uh, made a terrible oversight. My son Brad is in the back of the room, and, and his wife Nicole, my granddaughter Anna, came this evening. It was a surprise to me. Brad's a 1998 graduate of Olathe North High School. Uh, my other son, Stuart, was not able to be here. He's a 2001 graduate of Olathe North High School. So thank you, Brad. At each regular meeting, the Board of Education reserves limited time for individuals wishing to address the board. We request that individual speakers limit their comments to five minutes. The clerk will monitor the time and notify the speaker when the five minute time limit has expired. Please direct your comments to the entire board. If a response is appropriate, the president will respond or refer to another individual. In an effort to respect privacy, we ask that speakers refrain from discussing personal complaints involving individual staff members or students. Those speaking are advised that public comments are videotape recorded for broadcast on the district's educational access channel and audio tape recorded as a matter of public record. Individuals addressing the board should come to the podium at the front of the room and state your name. Ms. Hibbs, I don't believe anyone has signed up, but if there's anyone who would care to make public comment, um, we'd like to hear you. Okay, seeing none, we will move along. And we will hop back in our agenda at 6.09. That is the grounds lease with the Miracle League of Olathe for adaptive baseball field at the College Boulevard Activity Complex. Are there any questions or comments from board members? Well, the only comment I'd like to make again is, is, is in recognition of the Olathe Medical Center um, and the support that they give to the school district, and in this case, $125,000 that they are uh, pledging towards this. Um, again, this is one of the one of the community, one of the public little area or businesses here in the Kansas City area, um, specifically here in Olathe. And, and you've all heard me talk before about how important it is to recognize and also support our local businesses that actually support us back with tax paying money and things such as that. So I do want to just recognize that because that's quite a co contribution, $125,000 to help um, with this miracle um, network area. All right, then would someone? I just had a, a question in regard to uh, why there isn't a renewal option in the lease agreement. It runs for a 10 year term, but there wasn't any renewal option. I know legal counsel has reviewed and put their stamp of approval on this. Uh, was there any conversation about that? Again, uh, with the attorney drawing it up, I'm not sure why it was just a single 10 years. I feel bad you're catching me off guard a little bit because I think it's not at that, t but there is an opportunity. I thought when there you is reviewed it, you saw nothing because I thought there's somewhere else about the opportunity to renew. Okay. I Under the initial part of the lease, I, did, I didn't see it, but that would be something that could happen. The question had do. come up in terms of our other agreements too because this agreement then leads to the construction agreement with the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation and then the operation agreement with uh, Olathe Parks and Rec. So I knew the question had come up, and I know Mike Norris had gone back in and showed me where it was renewable, but the term of this initial was the 10-year, mm -hmm. then renewable by mutual agreement. Um, I can right. double check okay. at some point. Are you seeing it, Ms. Hibbs? Good. I thought it was there. Continues for 10 years, um, at which time the lease shall terminate unless extended in writing by mutual agreement of the parties. Well, yes, it, it is, but there's no specific term indicated for the renewal, just said it could be renewed, and that was the question okay. I had. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. <clears throat> Would anyone care to make a motion? I move to approve the ground lease between Unified School District number 233, Johnson County, Kansas, and Miracle League of Olathe Incorporated as presented. Second. 
Ms. Hibbs, I have a motion by Mr. Shearer and a second by Dr. Daniels. Would you call the roll, please? Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Ms. Ashley? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Motion carries. 6.10. We have a proposal for the sale of Mill Creek Center. Comments or questions? Dr. Berry, um, could you remind the board and um, viewers in our audience uh, what the most recent appraisal was for that building? As you know, we've talked about Mill Creek for, for quite some time. And again, it was a task force that was uh, ahead of the 07 bond issue that made the study that said we should build a new um, advanced technical center, which is what we're calling it, uh, uh, that will open this fall. But at that time, um, and we had some negotiations with a number of people that were interested, and at one time we thought there might be a land swap and so forth, just to remind you of that. And at that time, uh, we had an appraisal done. And um, there were a couple different pieces of that because part of it determined, well, if you're going to demolish part of it, do we take that out of the value? But to answer your question, Dr. Daniels, as I recall, that the last appraised value we had is, was between $1.1 and $1.2 million. Thank you. I want to make a comment about this proposal because it's, it was really a nice proposal that was brought to us. And I think it's one that um, had a lot of thought put into it, a lot of energy, a lot of community focus. I, I think the attempt was going to be uh, to, to do so much more out of this building in terms of just a simple purchase. Um, and, and several things were happening. But so there were a lot of components to it. And we, um, uh, again, were probably cheering on the side for it as it was coming forth. But at this point, uh, from staff uh, uh, analysis of this, we are recommending that it not be approved. And if we don't approve this, we have a use for the building? Uh, yes, yes, we have not had any other offers, you know, coming through, uh, and as our needs continue uh, to come up uh, with our growth, we are actually slipping in back in on the uh, west side uh, to have our uh, step-up program, which was formerly run by Greenbush, and we're taking that back over. And so, again, that's a part of the building that uh, heating and cooling work in it, uh, uh, very minimal work. We're going to be back in and starting up school for our, again, community program, uh, that has previously been located at Center of Grace. So the location in town is, is very similar. Um, and again, we're, we're excited about moving in and having that space for now. The listing agreement is still in force. It is. With the CBRE. It is. And so anything that we would negotiate, if we had another offer come, we would have to negotiate our continued use of, or parts of the building or when, when something might go into effect. But for now, we're going to use it. And do we have a one-year listing agreement with them. I'm looking to Merle or John. I don't remember. Sound right. Close. And how far into that listing agreement are we? So, okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? then I would entertain a motion. I move that we not accept the commercial real estate sales contract dated April 26, 2013 for the sale of the Mill Creek Center property. Second. Ms. Hibbs, I have a motion by Ms. Ashley and a second by Mr. Parker. Would you call the roll, please? Ms. Ashley? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. The motion carries. On to our other action items. 7.01, approval of the Kansas Association of School Boards and the National School Boards Association fees for 2013 and 14. Are there comments or questions? Then I would entertain a motion. Madam President, I would move to continue the membership affiliations with Kansas Association of School Boards the KASB Legal Assistance Fund and the National School Boards Association National Affiliate Program for the period of 7-1-13 through 6 14 as presented. Second. Ms. Hibbs, I have a motion by Mr. Parker and a second by Ms. Ashley. Would you call the roll, please? Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Ms. Ashley? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Mr. Poland? No.
Motion carries 7.02, our transportation safety variance areas for the next school year. Comments or questions? Then I would entertain a motion. I move to approve the cost increase to run buses in, in our safety variance areas for 2013 to 2014. Second. Ms. Hibbs, I have a motion by Mr. Shear and a second by Dr. Daniels. Would you call the roll, please? Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Polin? Yes. Ms. Ashley? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. The motion carries 7.03, our Masterworks concert request for a scheduling variance. Comments or questions? Then a motion? I move, I move to approve requested variance to hold Masterworks concert on Sunday, September 29, 2013 at 3 o'clock p.m. at Yardley Hall on the Johnson County Community College campus as presented. Second. Ms. Hibbs, I have a motion by Mr. Poland and a second by Ms. Ashley. Would you call the roll, please? Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Ms. Ashley? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. The motion carries. 7.04 would be an appointment to fill the remainder of Ms. Ashley's terms on the Kansas Association of School Boards Region 15 Vice President position. Um, I have expressed an interest in fulfilling that role. Are there any other board members? I think it would be great fun to nominate Mrs. Felter in her absence, <laughs> <laughs> but I won't do that, and so I will support your self-nomination, Amy. I move that nomination cease. Second. Ms. Hibbs, we have a motion by Ms. Ashley and a second by Mr. Parker. Would you call the roll, please? Mr. Polin? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Ashley? Yes. The motion carries. Uh, now we need a motion for the actual appointment. I move to appoint Amy Martin to serve as Region 15 Vice President on the Kansas Association of School Boards Board of Directors for the remainder of my three-year term effective July 1, 2013 through October 2014. Second. Ms. Hibbs, I have a motion by Ms. Ashley and a second by Dr. Daniels. Would you call the roll, please? Mr. Shear? Yes. Ms. Ashley? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Polin? Yes. Motion carries. Madam President, I would move to uh, approve 7.05 approval student trip future business leaders of America at Anaheim on June 27th, 30th, and 13th, and also 7.06, the student trip debate and forensics from Olathe North, Olathe Northwest to Birmingham, June 15, 2013. Second. Would you second both of those motions, Ms. Ashley? Yes. Would board members like to vote on those together? Yes. Yes. All right. Ms. Hibbs will be voting on two motions. Would you call the roll, please? Yes. Ms. Ashley? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Polin? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Very efficient work, Mr. Parker. Under future action items, we have our Head Start program location change and transportation work plan, a copy paper bid, a calculator bid, and a couple of Student trips, are there any comments or questions on those items? Can, can you speak a little bit about the change of the location for the Head Start program? It is um, a consortium in terms of we can take in other school districts can be a part of that Head Start. Um, the, I'll just share, uh, Gardner's had a site in the past uh, again, it's the big picture of the program looks at uh, enrollment and number of kids served and ability to have those programs. Uh, it has been decided that it can be better served by uh, having the site here in Olathe, uh, another site for us. We have students who are on a waiting list who will now be able to be served. Uh, the students in Gardner will still have access to this program. Uh, it'll just have to be a transportation. But again, it, due to enrollment really dropping and the ability to, to hang on to that program. Someone has wondered why did we have uh, separate programs anyway. 
well, with Head Start, if you have separate programs, you become in competition with each other. And so many times you'll have a group go together in an area like this so that it's a common cause and common budget that you can work through. So we'll bring on additional students with those additional dollars into our existing program. It's in, and go ahead, Dr. B. We'll have additional students that will be able to be served. We'll serve uh, probably additional Olathe students, but we are still capped the same number for our grant application. So uh, there won't be any additional students. It may be additional Olathe students, but the total number of students will not uh, change. Okay. We're still capped in the grant application. Okay. While we may want to serve additional students. Well, we those students, they could be Gardner students, they but they be. may also be Olathe students. They all may also be Olathe students. The biggest waiting list is Olathe students. Okay. I remember there were like 80 some, but was there, the waiting list was pretty high. The waiting is, list is higher than we would certainly like it to be, yes. <clears throat> Uh, the board has received several written information items, uh, construction change orders, our school site council report, um, some options for alternative, alternative high school graduation sites, and our Head Start monthly director's report. I, I know that the board has received some communication about graduation sites. Do board members have any comments that they would like to make? I think this is a really tough decision. And you're glad that you won't be here for it? <laughs> and I'm glad that I won't be here. I had a conversation just this week with a Blue Valley parent. And this particular parent wasn't really excited about going to Kemper Arena. Uh, she said, my gosh, my kid was just a pin dot down there on the stage. And we were way up in the rafters. And she said, I, I would just as soon have been crammed in the bleachers somewhere as to be stuck way up in the rafters. So that's that's one opinion from a parent who's experienced it. Somebody else might want to elaborate on the email that we received from another parent. Well, I look at all of these options, and, and quite honestly, I don't think any of them are good options. Just like continuing the way that we do it now is really not the best option we have. But we did receive an email from a parent, and I've heard from friends whose students are athletes, and that weekend coincides with a lot of state competitions. And if we start changing the date and the times, it, it will make it virtually impossible for some of our students to attend their own graduation. And to me, um, as much as I would like my family to attend when my kids graduate. I think it's more important the child attends when they graduate. And so that, that weighs very heavily on, on my decision. And, right. and, and I don't look forward to making this decision. Yes. Well, I think, go ahead. I think Mr. Parker and I have been here long enough that we could probably recite all of these options from memory. Um, and we've agonized over this multiple times. And, and there is such not a good solution that it always comes back to doing it at the high school. And um, I'm having a hard time thinking about it being any place else. I, I understand and appreciate the work that's gone into this because we've done it several times now. You can probably recite it from memory as well. Um, and, and I appreciate that. And for every parent who... Um, wants to stay in their home school, there are, are going to be parents who are unhappy because there are not enough tickets for their family members to be there. And, and I'm respectful of that, but um, I'm having a hard time thinking about leaving our district for graduation. I, I want to give some credit to Dr. Shirk for leading high school principals through this study and continued discussion. The high school principals struggle with it. Uh, they like it in their home uh, gyms and auditoriums. Um, they know that we will be giving some things up if we were to move to a, a large site. The, the only advantage to the large site is, is why and why we consider it is because of the comments we hear about. I can't bring everybody I want to. So that that's the only thing that we would accomplish by doing that is bringing everybody that you would want to because, again, they seed an awful lot. We're also concerned as we continue to get bigger. Uh, right now we were at... Um, the, the lowest number of tickets was at Olathe North, four tickets per family, uh, five at East, five at South, and six at Olathe Northwest. Um, 
Again, then we also, as you know, we set up overflow areas. You can watch it uh, in the auditorium or a flex theater or an alternate uh, gym. Um, so we try to do that as well. But the principals have also struggled, but they finally at least wanted to move forward and really be serious about some options. Uh, a few of the options are, as I've uh, pointed out and Gretchen put in a report, level ground so you wouldn't be able to, to be up to be able to see what's happening, uh, let alone it be a pin dot if someone is that, that small. Um, the option is still available for us next year. Uh, became limited as well because it just takes one or two schools to lock into something and we're out. Um, the times that are offered to us are to rotate, you know, again, and cooperate with another school district. And we could probably accommodate three of our four high schools that way next year. Uh, Olathe Northwest would be content to, to still do theirs at home. Uh, the other option for us that's been suggested as well is going outside. Um, the hesitation by our high school principals is not only weather, uh, but right now it is the fact that you are on a surface, a grass uneven surface that many times could be muddy or soggy would make it very difficult to put up chairs and so forth. We fully understand if we go try to move outside that at a given time on that day, you have to make it a, an early decision. Uh, we're going to move it inside and then we immediately would be back to the ticket allocation system, which we could do. Um, if, if we are successful with the bond issue and we have turf a year from now, uh, I think the principals feel differently about that. So uh, I think that's the latest thought as we will talk with principals again uh, next week, I believe Tuesday. Uh, maybe we hang on for one more year and, and then look at maybe an outside as we continue to look at other options available to us in the area. But again, we're very interested in your comments tonight in terms of moving outside. So with the artificial turf <clears throat> field, is that such that you could put chairs on it without damaging the turf? Yes. Is there not double the cost because wouldn't you have to set up outside, but if you're making a decision at 2 o'clock for a 6 o'clock ceremony, you obviously have to have a gym set up as ready well. Ready to go, yes. You have to have a, a separate system ready. Um, again, with two complexes, obviously, we're going to have two graduations at each complex, and, and so you have some savings by... You know, right now we rent chairs for all of our schools and sound system maybe and things like that. So some sharing, but you're exactly right. Uh, to double set up, it's going to be some additional cost. It is obviously, as you saw in the proposal, additional cost to go to someplace like Kemper Arena. Um, uh, well, Dr. Barry, this is one board member that will never vote for an outside graduation. Okay. <laughs> Just think if we would have had it set up this year for an outside graduation. Fortunately, the storm went north of us, but had it come through Olathe, all those chairs would be somewhere in Missouri. <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, you have to have it and make that call very early. There can be no, absolutely no chance. No. I mean, I, I fully understand, but there are schools that have outside graduation, and on the right night, it's beautiful um, and, and very you know cool and so forth. But I fully understand uh, you just can't take a chance with yeah, weather. Right. It's just uh, just too much risk. And I remember Dr. All, we had high outside, outside graduation in 1998 that got blown away, and they moved it inside, and Dr. All said she would never, ever have another outside graduation, and I still remember that. Yeah. So We didn't call her, but uh, she... <laughs> <laughs> Probably still has that opinion. Well, well this board member is biased by, by, by her experience, so she was terrified. Yeah. So. If we moved to outside graduation, though, we would still have to schedule two, two different days. Right, yeah, you'd be, yeah. Two per day or on two separate days? Uh, again, that would be determined, but uh, when you're set up, you'd, I would think you'd have two um, at each location on that day, so you're... So would, would that impact some of our student athletes as well? You know, it's possible um, as we explored that a little bit, you know, the one good piece of news I can share with you that uh, for the next two years, swimming and, and maybe another activity have been moved back one week. And so if we're still in the same weekend, we don't have any uh, uh, conflicts, but that's not always the case, maybe. Uh, but I know it, I was at the Olathe East graduation this year and they had a student slip in right at the end because he, I think, came from a golf tournament. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if that graduation ceremony had been earlier in the day, it would have would been a challenge for him. Exactly. When I was at North this year, I was talking to Mr. Uh, Mr. Morford about outside graduation. He has an experience about yes, one yes, way, yes. <laughs> about the same thing when they were moving it from outside inside. And could you imagine how fast a Kansas thunderstorm comes up? They haven't even got everybody out of the stadium, outside stadium yet, and it's pouring down rain with the wind blowing and a tornado warning. 
Now this year we actually postponed graduation by a day. If we were renting a facility, what would our option be if we had to postpone by a day? Yeah, um, really just depends. But when we're set up on a weekend, typically a first week night or so would be okay at the locations we've looked at. But it, it would have to be uh, determined and, and some planning uh, put into that. You're right. Okay. Well, you see, I know you want uh, input feedback from board members and along with Dr. Daniels. For the last 14 years, we have had this same discussion. And for the last 14 years, I have come to the same conclusion. <laughs> Keep it in Olathe at the high schools. You know, and again, I think our principals. And I'll probably get a million emails. Tell them. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, when you look at all of the other alternatives, and there, like um, Dr. Daniel says, there's just not any good optimal solution other than us building a really, really nice facility somewhere in Olathe where we could have our own graduation build a camp arena in Olathe, and then we could have graduation there. But going off uh, out of the city, um, I, I think, is a disservice to, the, to, our, to our families and to the kids and to the community. As you saw in the proposal, if you move outside of the community, where there are costs to make sure we have some buses for the orchestra group, the band that plays, and so forth. Uh, not to give Phil Clark up, but uh, Phil Clark said we should dome one of our football stadiums, uh, and that would <laughs> well, take care go. of it. But, uh, well, it's not even just the the chorus and the band who, that would be transporting. I, I mean, I, I think about my three sons and their their probably unwillingness to drive with their boring parents and grandparents to graduation and wanting to drive on their own to Kemper. I mean, I think you. I, I just think there are lots of issues that. Not that they couldn't have an accident driving to Olathe South, but fortunately they did not. Sure. But, you know, I, I just think there are, are additional issues that come up when you remove it to such a distance. Another thing that I think we need to consider is project graduation. Mm -hmm. Because the way it stands right now, we capture those students right after graduation and whisk them away to a, a safe activity, and it might be more of a challenge to get kids to participate in that. It could be. If there's a... Like if their one group is graduating at 1 o'clock. Yeah. yeah, or or the night before even, which is one of our options. Mm -hmm. Well, I've always, always, I guess, been uh, against having anything outside the uh, high schools, but uh, uh, I've just sort of kept an open mind to it because we've done such a wonderful job researching it, and thank you, Dr. Shirk, also, uh, for, you know, because it's great information. Uh, anytime you have a big decision like this, you know, or every year we hear from people, mm -hmm. I would be interested to know, we always hear from the people that are dissatisfied, what percentage of the graduates do we actually hear from? I mean, are we hearing from a 5% group? Are we hearing from 50% of the parents? No, it's pretty, I, it's I, pretty minor, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, while we want to appease everybody, naturally the only ones you hear from are the ones that are unhappy usually. That means, you know, 90% of the people are satisfied with it. They may, you know, at least they're not voicing their opinion, that they're totally dissatisfied. So, I, you know, uh, you know, with, I guess I would like the principals maybe in the future to, to log how many people actually complaints they've got to see how significant of a problem it is. Yeah. Because from, you know, unless it becomes significant, I don't see a reason to change myself. Yeah. And, and again, uh, I want to give credit to our principals who are on the front line and have to answer a lot of those questions and get hit up for tickets. And I, I think they were really trying to respond to some additional requests uh, um, from, from a number of sources that were saying, when are you going to consider and, and, you know, go and do it like so-and-so does and, and uh, go to a bigger place. So they were trying to respond and they are very open. And Mike, you made a good point about open mind to, to change if we need to. So... Uh, I think we'll go back and have some more conversation uh, with principals, uh, but I'm hearing uh, concerns about double setup and outside graduation, concerns about going outside of our community. Um, let, let's see if we can continue and uh, stay, stay at home. Have we considered asking our students what their priorities are? You know, that was something else somebody had shared. And my opinion, what really happens once we hit the night and uh, everybody's happy and the students walked across the stage, we kind of forget about the, the lack of tickets sometimes. And, and I hate to say this, but sometimes even people share with me that certain family members are glad they, they don't have to go sit on a gymnasium uh, uh, bleacher. 
<laughs> they still get to be a part of it. They get to go to dinner. They get to go to the party. They're, they're there celebrating as a family. Um, there's also been uh, talk, you know, can we stream something? Uh, can we give others more options even that it could be um, at home that you could get a computer and, and again, feel like you're a part of it? Because as one of you mentioned, if we go to Kemper Arena and you're seeing a tiny little ant down there, uh, it, it might be better to, to do something electronically even. So um, sounds like we will talk some more, but uh, we're not in a hurry to, to go. Well, Dr. Berry, it sounds like we have a lot of questions. Do you anticipate bringing us something? I wanted to, to bring you on? discussion tonight. I did not want to put you in a position to say, let's vote up or down. We need to continue no, to but, talk. But can we expect to be voting up yes. or down at some point? Uh, I, I think it would be if we were to bring a, a recommendation to do something different. Uh, would not bring it to, back to you to say we're going to stay in our gyms. I think it would only be if we really want to move forward. That'd be okay. Thank you. Would you let us know when you're going to do that, and I'll plan my vacation. Is there? <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can come with me. Okay. <laughs> you know, you know I, and uh, Dr. Daniels, I appreciate it. But Mr. Poland brings up a good point. You know, uh, I want to, we want to be sensitive to everyone, and so, but where's the really concern here? And, and I agree with him, you know, I think far and away, many, many of the, the biggest majority of our parents appreciate being in, in the community, close to home, in their own schools, and I know our business community appreciates it because then when they go to graduation, they patronize local businesses, and they're not going somewhere else for their dinners and their parties. So um, there's a lot of pluses for keeping it the way it is. I understand there's some negatives, but when you weigh it out, I think the pluses outweigh the, well, out, far outweigh the negatives. And the ne negative is just the number of tickets. That's it. Not that that's not inconsequential, not that, 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 that that's not important. But when you look at all the positives versus the negative, I think um, to me it becomes pretty clear that Staying home is is a, a best option. Thank you, everyone. Are there any additional topics that board members would like to bring for discussion? Okay, Dr. Barry, what do you have for us? Yeah, just a few comments. This is our first board meeting since we completed the school year. And so I want to say thanks to everybody officially from the Board of Education to district administration to building administration, teaching staff, support staff, bus drivers, cafeteria personnel, and so forth for a really, really fine school year of uh, educating, preparing more than 29,000 students. So again, a public thank you to our entire staff for a good school year. Also want to uh, say is thank you to a lot of people, but uh, we had a very successful summer conference again, over 1,400 educators, uh, wonderful national and local uh, presenters. A special thanks to Jan Hine and her office, Teaching and Learning, Dr. Banikowski, Luann Hermrick, and, and countless others that really put on a top-notch summer conference. Um, uh, really neat, so that's great. Uh, a couple other just quick things I want to share with you. We got a report today, or I did a printout from the State Department. Last year during the legislative session, there was Senate Bill 155 that um, the governor wanted to put some money into vocational certification. And for every student that got certified, the district would get $1,000. That helps us pay for the testing and some of the, the materials that go with that. Uh, I got the list from across the state, and we had 52 students from the Olathe District that received uh, that certification uh, in some form in many areas. That's 25% more than any other district uh, in the state. So again, uh, whether it's a Hutchinson vocational school or Wichita or whoever it was, we uh, by far are getting kids through that certification process. So that's wonderful. I want to mention the project, <coughs> excuse me, at 127th Street. <clears throat> That one choked you up. <laughs> <laughs> construction and street construction always does that. <laughs> um, as you know, they are heavy into it on 127th Street, but the very first section that will be coming from Black Bob to the entrance of Olathe East High School will be completed by August of 2013. Wow. That's critical to us, obviously. <clears throat> the next section, the next little part that goes on east to Greenwood will be completed by the end of 2013, so sometime late fall. And then finally, the rest of the work uh, all the way east will be late fall 2014. Uh, so those are the dates that I have. But thank goodness uh, we're going to be able to get into our school uh, by August of this year. 
I want to mention, uh, again, just a couple more things. Uh, legislature wrapped up their session and, and have gone home. And the really good news for us is that we have a tax bill and we have a budget. And so now uh, things are going to start to happen for us as a school district. The budget workshops are being scheduled, and John and staff will attend those. Uh, we'll get ready to, to finalize a budget and bring it to you in July and then certification in August. But the, the highlight for us, obviously, is that we needed to have um, a tax bill and a budget. There is an advocacy meeting set for next Wednesday night, the 12th. Uh, we once again are hosting that from KASB. I uh, would ask that you uh, uh, can attend if possible. Uh, there's a, a light uh, dinner. It's, it's open to the area. Uh, school districts get information and other uh, districts can come and attend. Uh, KASB staff wants to sit down and talk about the next session, the next platform in terms of uh, legislative positions. And so that will be the focus for this group. And then, of course, uh, I, I need to mention the uh, bond issue that we are currently uh, pending right now. Uh, the last official count that I think we got yesterday, uh, almost 21,000 ballots have been cast. Uh, that's uh, pretty close to on par with what happened in 2007, which was our last um, mail-in ballot. Um, if people that did not get a ballot, we have found out you can still go to the election office. Uh, you can sign a form that says you never received one or didn't receive it and don't have it, and you can actually vote right then and still uh, have it count. So that's an option for them. Uh, otherwise, it's getting down to the wire if someone's going to mail it because it has to be received by uh, noon next Tuesday. We should have notification um, one way or the other by 5 p.m. next Tuesday. Uh, so, of course, we will let you know. Um, and those will be my comments tonight. Thank you. We will need an executive session this evening. Uh, Dr. Berry, I believe we need about an hour. Do you have anything that you would like to add to that? Yeah, we need about 30 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes. So that puts us... Um, <laughs> late. <laughs> I want to make Rita's last regular board meeting yeah. going out with a bang. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> All right, would someone care to make a motion? I'd move that the board adjourn to executive session for the purpose of discussing personnel matters of non-elected personnel, to discuss matters relating to employer-employee negotiations, and for the preliminary discussion relating to the acquisition of real property, and that the board return to the regular meeting at, what, 945? Yes, please. In this room, the executive session is required in order to provide the privacy, protect the privacy interests of the individuals to be discussed, to protect the district's right to the confidentiality of its negotiating position and the public interest, and to protect the district's financial interest and bargaining position. Second. Ms. Hibbs, I have a motion by Mr. Pollan and a second by Mr. Parker. Would you call the roll, please? Mr. Shear. Yes. Ms. Ashley. Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes.